I'm going to go ahead and kick this off. It's a smaller crowd. We may have some joining uh, folks as they uh, come back from tours and figure out where we are in this big building, too. So um, I am going to go ahead and kick this off. And we are recording this uh, seminar for uh, some audiences that requested it. So if you have questions, that's a good thing to know ahead of time that it is being recorded. But I'm going to introduce our Science in the Valley speaker for tonight is Dr. Vince Jones. He is a full professor of entomology for WSU and has expertise in uh, integrated pest management and has done some work that he's going to talk to us about today um, that integrates weather and climate data, sounds like, and entomology uh, and uh, those integrated pest management practices is going to potentially have global impact on the way that agriculture um, is done. So I'm excited to hear a little bit more about that. And I'm going to keep my introduction short and sweet and turn it back. So. Thank you so much, Sue. Yeah. OK, so thank you all for coming. Um, Pleasure to be here today. And what I'm going to do today is talk about using the WSU decision support tools that we've been developing in the last few years to not only understand the past, but improve the present and anticipate the future for tree fruit IPM. Sure. Oh, glad you noticed that. <laughs> um, I can tell you the slide was really good. So, <laughs> What I'm going to do first is give you a little bit of background, why you would even make a decision support tool, how insect models work at a very um, low level, or high level, I should say. Talk about helping the present, which is our WSU decision support system, and then evaluating past spray decisions with these pesticide effects models that we've developed. Um, and then anticipating the future, essentially running our decision support tool and pesticide effects models with climate change scenarios. And then the very last slide is here for the department chair. Actually drove all the way over just to hear this talk. So it's a slide just for you, Laura. So why would you want to develop one of these decision support tools? I've worked on this for about 10 years now. <clears throat> one of them is the ratio of information consumers information providers is at least 600 to 1 in the industry, probably actually closer to 1,000 to 1. The next thing is that we have really narrow windows in time where we have to do management decisions, or else it really doesn't matter. And one of the ways to do that is to use forecasts so that you can look to the future and tell the people, you need to be ready for this event that's going to occur. And what this does is it allows people to actually manage so integrated pest management with management in there instead of just reacting to the problems of the day. The internet uh, and cell coverage has also radically changed information flow. So nowadays, people don't have to call me up to find out uh, what the status is of these um, different models and what they need to be doing. They can access it anytime they want on the internet. And then when you're doing this, the other thing is that you can dynamically represent the data. It's easier to display and also easier to understand. A big thing, though, is minimizing errors through a long chain of providers. And if we did this sort of game, this telephone game, where I um, spoke um, to one person on the left and said something like, Fords make the best cars, it could come out the other end as sand is needed to make concrete. So you really need to make sure that there's not errors that happen in the transmission of the information that you're generating. And then a big part here is the time lag that actually happens between when our traditional education system for tree fruit growers happens. And so this is between December and about the middle of, of March. But a lot of the problems that we're talking about happen in August or July. And so it's really easy to essentially forget that in the heat of the moment there, and they'll essentially miss all that education that was done previously. And then as um, my hair gets a little bit grayer, um, the preservation of expertise becomes more important. Not just my knowledge, but also the knowledge of people like Tim Smith, who is our world expert on fire blight. 
you don't want to essentially have that person retire and then just lose that expertise. So we can integrate that stuff into our decision support systems and then allow people to essentially, um, as you get new faculty that come in, they can have a little bit of breather and then they can start making the changes they need as new science becomes available. So again, when you look at the past diseases and horticultural issues, management is really dominated by problems with really narrow windows of opportunities that they can mitigate that. Fire blight is one of the best examples of this. It's a bacterial disease of apple and pear. When the conditions are right, that is when you have uh, rainfall and warm temperatures in the spring and the flowers are open and the bacterium is present, growers have 24 hours uh, to get their treatments on. If they go out to 36 hours, they can do that, but the efficacy of their controls drop dramatically. And after that point, you're basically worried about losing your orchard. Coddling moth is one of my favorite pests. This is one that feeds on the larvae feed directly on the apples and pears. If you miss a treatment window, you can actually get increases of 3 to 5% egg hatch per day, and then you can get things that look like this. Um, so you can't sell too many of those. Uh, that's actually in one of my research blocks. So nobody would normally have that sort of problem. But you still can have a serious issue. Come on. Okay, sunburn browning is another one. This is the largest post-harvest loss category. It's caused by high heat, greater than 86 degrees, low wind speed, clear skies, and you need either overhead cooling, netting, or protective sprays on susceptible cultivars to keep from um, putting what looks like perfect fruit that go into the storage, but get out as essentially mushy, ugly, brown things. And then bloom management is another one of these, where if you set too many fruit, you need to thin them off, otherwise you end up with a large number of fruit about the size of your thumb. The potential cost for hand thinning, which is the last resort, can be about $1,400 per acre. So it's really a big incentive to do this uh, stuff right. So how do these models work? Well, almost all of these models that I'm going to talk today are ones that are based essentially on heat unit accumulation. So the developmental rates of different organisms are based on the variety of biochemical reactions that occur in the cells of the organism. They have a clear optimal temperature. This is actually real data that you see here. This is a um, insect that I worked with when I was at the University of Hawaii. So um, at about 55 degrees, I can't really see it that well from here, maybe 60 degrees. Um, you're taking about 11 days to develop. You're doing about 9% development per day. When you get up here at about 30 degrees or so, you're actually doing about 10, uh, 33% per day. So in three days, you can get this going on. One of the big things is that you have this fairly uh, high sensitivity to heat. So as you go from what looks like the maximum right here to zero development rate, it's only about five degrees Fahrenheit there. And so basically, if you know the temperatures that the organism has been exposed to, you can predict developmental rates. So there's a couple things I want to mention. The lower threshold for development is essentially down here, where you extrapolate that linear portion down to the point, the point where you have a zero development rate. And then the maximum development rate here, which is just after the peak there, so the upper threshold for development. So warm-blooded animals, this sort of thing, we don't even notice it because the core body temperatures are relatively stable. So whether you're a, a beautiful grandniece, an awesome puppy dog, or a more than slightly evil cat, um, they all have development rates which are fairly constant there and the physiological uh, processes occur at a relatively constant rate. And so your development rate is closely related to calendar time. And so you can actually look at young children and go, yeah, they're about three or they're about four or something like that, because they develop at a fairly constant rate compared to other animals. So if you're an organism that can't regulate your body temperature, and insects are a great example of this, 
they can't regulate their body temperature for any significant amount of time. So they can get in the sunlight, they can get in the shade, or they can flap their flight muscles to warm up so that they can fly at low temperatures, but they can't do that for a significant period of time. It's just not possible. And so the development rate is actually solely based on the temperature they're exposed to by the time they're exposed to it. And so this is what is called heat units or degree days. And a very simple definition is a degree day is when the temperature is one degree above the lower threshold for development for a 24 hour period. And age is defined by heat units, which is known as physiological time. <clears throat> the consequences of this in terms of management is you can't predict the development rates using calendar time to any significant degree because we have different heat profiles that they're exposed to throughout the season. If the temperature is low, it could take weeks or months to actually finish development. If it's higher temperatures, it can take days. And so essentially, we can't predict using calendar time what's going on. Another thing is, is that growers want you to tell them on the 15th of October or 15th of January, I want to do this, or the 15th of June, I want to do this. But last year's timing don't happen again because the heat profile during the season is different. Plant development is also related to temperature. And so the synchrony between uh, a plant development period, for example, the bloom period, will not line up on a regular basis unless the lower threshold for development is the same. And unfortunately, each insect and plant species has a different lower threshold for development. And it's pretty much random that they line up perfect. But the nice thing about this is that once the model is developed, it can be used to predict um, using past, present, or future temp uh, temperature profiles so that you can see how different things occur over time. OK, so our decision aid system is actually a cloud-based system that integrates environmental data, forecasts, models, management options, and various databases together so that it's basically a one-stop shop for people. So we have 175 different environmental monitoring stations across the state. This is what's known as Washington State University's Ag WeatherNet system. We use seven-day hourly forecasts that we get from a commercial provider, Dark Sky. And then there's longer range forecasts which use the current temperature up to this point in time, the seven-day forecast, and then a 10-year average forecast to allow us to look about six weeks into the future. And those long-range forecasts are actually pretty decent. We can be within about an average of about four days at six weeks out. So it's not too bad. You can get some higher error rates, but it's really pretty rare. And then all the data has to go through air checking routines because we've got burned with the quality of some of the data that we've got. So. Right now, we have 28 different models. Currently, there's another eight that should go online next year. So we have 10 pest insects with four new ones coming. We have four natural enemy models. These are predators or parasitoids that attack pest insects. We have a model on honeybee foraging. We have three disease models and 14 horticultural models, with the majority of those hort models being things like bloom timing, and fruit growth, so we can actually predict partway through the season what the fruit profile size-wise will be and when that should actually happen. And then the sunburn model is one of the big ones there as well. We have about 55 seasonally uh, relevant stories, which are triggered, stored in the database and triggered either by calendar date or by the models, and linked to more in-depth articles so that you can continually um, look for what's new uh, coming up. It's available and works on desktop, phones, and tablets, computers. So we started this in 2006 with about 12 models total, and we had 13 beta users. In two years, we had 250 users. The outreach programs that we had to do to get people familiar with it, we had a mobile lab of netbook computers. For those of you a little bit young, netbook computers think Chromebook, you know, they don't even sell them anymore. Um, to do on-site training, we had probably over 100 presentations 
at venues all over the state. And then we've surveyed them multiple times. The users estimated that they cover 90% of the total acreage in the state, and they're estimating the savings uh, is about $75 per acre, which is about $16 million for our industry. That number will change rather dramatically, I think, and I'll show you why in a minute. Uh, in 2016, the Okanagan Kootenai Sterile Insect Release Program came to us and said, would you please um, develop this for our system up in British Columbia? So we partnered with them uh, and Ag Canada, the equivalent of USDA, and the provisional government to make sure that the system works for them. And it's been in uh, place uh, full time for the last two years. So this is our decision support system. So these are the stories that I mentioned. So again, these rotate depending on the time. And if you click on one of those stories, what you see is something that's generally two to three paragraphs. And if it can't be done in a fairly short size, then what we do is refer you to something else, um, either the WSU um, Orchard Pest Management Online or some other source for the information. So if we go to my account, so let's see if I can get the thing to work. We can just click on this. And this is uh, in my favorite insect here. These are all the different insects and models that we have that are on my profile. And so up here you have today, you have the number of degree days. This is for forecast. You can click on these or click over here, and I'll show you that in a second. This actually explains what the model means and what it's doing. And then we have the conventional management that is appropriate for this point in the season. Okay, where to go? Okay, so we can click on this. Oh, excuse me. And we have the different stations where I have coddling moth model in there, and you could choose any one of those. We have um, the ability to get the forecast, and so it changed that. We can also come over here where it says conventional management, touch that, and it'll give you the organic management associated with it. And then we can come up here, compress that. So this is a graph which shows, um, as of last week, what was going on. So we have the first generation of adults. This is the first generation of eggs hatching, and second, and then the third, and this is where we're at at this point in time. There are four different graphs there. Um, we'll look at this one here, which shows you essentially the, the normal distribution curve where you're seeing the um, peaks and valleys of the population level over time. And you can also graph that instead of just against degree days versus calendar days. So this is what we call the mini spray guide. So at this time of the season, there's actually 14 materials which are okay to use for coddling moth that are recommended by WSU. And you see those right here. And then down here, you've got the maximum residue levels. And so these are, uh, this is a database that we built in my lab and then the Northwest Hort Council actually maintains. And so these are the different chemicals. And then you have the different uh, countries where those residue levels are in parts per million. So these are all major export markets for um, the state of Washington. So Codex is sort of the generic one for EU, Canada, China. Um, I have to look at this slide here. Hong Kong, Indone India, Indonesia, Malawi, um, or Malaysia, uh, Saudi Arabia, and so forth down there. So you can get that stuff. And again, we don't maintain that. That's one of the things we don't want to do is maintain all these databases because it's a lot of time and effort, plus there's a lot of legal stuff. But that's what they actually do. They're part of the export market. You can also come up here where it says uh, view the full spray guide. And so this shows you for coddling moth and apples, the late spring and summer. These are all the materials, and you could scroll it down. You can say, okay, well, I want to look at only the organic alternatives and choose that. What it does is grays out all the ones that aren't organic and re um, shuffles it, essentially, so that you can see the ones there. You can um, go back, and you can also say, okay, I've got oblique banded leaf roller problem as well, so I want to put on a spray that will take care of both oblique banded leaf roller and coddling moth, and if you click on that, it does the same thing. 
There's also the ability to compare these different materials. And you can see three of them are already selected. And then you can go to the comparison view and see just a bunch of uh, general information, the name of the different compounds, practice whether it's conventional or organic, the rate per acre, the reentry uh, interval, pre-harvest interval, the bee toxicity, whether it's uh, active, it's an insecticide in this case. And then you can also scroll down. Okay, let me do this. And it shows you the efficacy against a number of different pests, and all three of them have both the bleak banded leaf roller and codling moth there. And then these are natural enemies that we want to protect. And so, for example, if you have a spider mite problem in your orchard, what you want to do is use one that's green over here versus the one that's red, because otherwise you're going to kill off the natural enemies for spider mites, and then you're going to have to spray for spider mites in addition to coddling moth and everything else. And then there's also on this, you can see uh, numbers on each of these things. And so what uh, I had a postdoc that actually, and most of you know Uta Chambers, she actually um, did a survey of all the um, tree fruit growing areas in the US that, and North and Canada that were not using our recommendation. Plus, we went to the copper database in Europe, which is a large um, database that is, they have a almost like a pipeline where they look at every insecticide that's being developed on a wide range of insects and uh, mites and things. And so we integrate both of those in there to show. These are the different materials, um, what their relative toxicity is, as well as what are the different things that they've been tested against. So this is a honeybee foraging model. Um, so this is some work that we did with uh, one of my colleagues I'll mention in a little bit. Um, but basically, we look at the last three days, and then what today's conditions are, and then what the next three days. And if we go up and collapse that, we allow the person to come here and look, and you can see that we actually had pretty good foraging rates here. This is percent of the optimum uh, for the two days, uh, uh, three and two days ago. And then yesterday, it dropped really low, and then it's starting to pick up again. So this down here shows you the factors that actually affect the honeybee foraging. So solar radiation and cloudiness, essentially, the temperature, the rainfall and wind effect all affect foraging rates. And so you can see in this case here that the wind effect was the biggest and temperature was the biggest uh, factor depressing the um, honeybee foraging that occurred in that area, whereas it warmed up and the wind speed dropped off the last couple of days there. Fire blight, again, this is that bacterial disease. So again, this um, they've only got a short window here. And so again, we have the same sort of thing where we have the conditions. We have the management for both conventional and organic. We can collapse this get up there. And then this is the graph that shows this point in time. And so you can see that this is extreme risk. This is um, high risk. And then we have um, a marginal risk down here. So the risk has been dropping, but then you get rainfall here and it warms up a little bit, and the risk goes way up. And so, again, we're able to look in the future so that they can see this and respond before that 24-hour window closes. We can also come up here and, I, and show the weather forecast. And you can get a whole range of things. So we have the wind speed there in this uh, graph right here. That is because, obviously, you don't want to have too much wind speed when you're applying things where you get too much drift. Um, this is a radar map so that you can actually look at the precipitation forecast. But there's actually, um, I didn't capture this, but there's about 10 different parameters that you can look at. Um, and plus, you can make it go forward and backward in time to get an idea whether it rained at your actual location versus where the weather station was. Sunburn browning, this is a, another one of those things. So again, um, we tell you what the conditions are. And but if I cancel that, oops, I didn't mean to cancel that. There we go. Um, close that one. This is my favorite view of this. Essentially, what you can see is the red areas here. 
And this is when we had our um, meeting out at Sunrise, uh, the extension meeting, when it was 99, 96, and 97 degrees, which was miserable. Uh, and then immediately it dropped down to 90, and then it could drop it into the 80s. But essentially, it lets you know ahead of time. So we're using forecasts for everything for this because you don't want to tell the person, by the way, you got burned Tuesday. You want to say, next Tuesday, if you haven't done anything, you could get burned. Okay. So just a summary of this part here then is, we provide the current forecast conditions and management that are appropriate to the model. We have both the short and long-term forecasts available for most things. We integrate a wide range of problems in entomology, horticulture, plant pathology into one site. We work with a beta user group to make sure that the problems are minimized. I would much rather get 13 angry phone calls than 400. Um, and we're trying to make sure that we meet the needs of the industry. What can we do to make it better? We're constantly improving as new models and tactics come available. There's a robust computing infrastructure now which allows expansion. We were handcuffed for quite a while on that. And it's part of a larger ecosystem of decision support system. Um, and so I'm going to talk next about this one down here. Uh, so pesticides, um, looking at the future or the past, and uh, working with one of my colleagues, um, Ag Climate Net is another one which is using essentially some of these same models to run with the climate change projections. And then uh, potatoes.wsu or decisionaids.systems which is um, one that we're developing with one of my colleagues on campus, Dave Crowder. So let's switch now to look at looking at the past. So we need to look at the past a lot of times to improve the future or the present. Even with DAS, people have problems with timely management. And looking at the past management actually clarifies a number of things. So one, it'll give you the indication of how wide is this window in time which we can actually do something? But what is the urgency of the timing? And also, how can we make this better for the future? So we're focusing on the use of spray records. These are legal documents, and they're really the difference between what they said they did and what they actually did. And that's an important thing, because oftentimes when you're talking to people and you've given the same talk multiple times, you assume that they um, comprehended everything you said and they're doing exactly what you told them and they'll nod their heads at the right time and you won't really know. But when you actually look at the spray records, it takes all the BS out of the whole thing. So you actually see exactly what they had to do. And one of the other things it does is it gives you the length of time it actually took them to spray that field. Um, so again, if the window is really narrow and you've got a thousand acres and you're trying to spray it with one or two sprayers, you can't do that and have it actually hit the targets that you want. Another thing is the IPM consultant could be absolutely correct on the timing, but things like the grower's tractor was broke, the well pump was waiting for parts, the sprayer had a family emergency. Any of those are really good excuses, but the truth is, regardless of the excuse, the insects and diseases don't really care. And then you basically get hammered with damage later on. So this system actually uses the same heat-driven models that DAS does, but we account for it a lot better so that we can actually see the numbers that are affected by the different sprays. We can show the users when the sprays went on compared to the target stages. We can estimate the effects of a single spray or a combination of multiple sprays on the seasonal population level. There are multiple rules, but one key one that I think most um, managers forget is if you kill a portion of the population in one generation, the following generation is also affected at that same time. And so graphically, this is the San Jose scale, so it's about the center 50% of the population is in uh, when we treated here. So if you look at this, you expect that first generation to be knocked down in that period where the pesticide was applied. But you also get that same sort of reduction in that second generation, 
we're getting population growth between here. So this thickness down here is quite a bit higher than that thickness, or this one here is thicker than that one from the um, reproduction, but you still knock down the population in that area. Okay, so this is just a, a quick overview, and then I'll give you an example of using this on uh, farms. So this is the, the website. If you go to it, you can um, choose the orchard. So these are all 175 stations that WSU has. We have uh, seven different insect models. You can choose any one of them. And again, because I like coddling moth, I'm going to choose that one. Um, and then I put in two sprays. So one is on the 12th of May, one was on the 28th. And then if you just hit the run model button here, what happens is it first shows you up here in a table when it went on and off on a degree day basis, as well as what portion of the population was there. But this is really the money graph here. So it shows you, I left a hole in there. So you can actually see right there, there was no knockdown, no coverage in that area. And there's no coverage in that part of the population uh, either. And so then this graph here, or this table, shows you this is the untreated population, so it's 100%. If this spray, number one, went on by itself and nothing else was applied, you'd get the population knocked down to 82.9%. This one here would be knocked down by itself, would cause a reduction down to 45.2%. This is the first spray, and this is the first and the second spray. And this is without mating disruption. So those of you not familiar with it, mating disruption is putting synthetic pheromones across the entire orchard so that the males can't find the females, and then essentially by delaying the time that it takes for the males to find the females, you reduce the reproductive capacity and survival of those female moths. This then is the same thing, but with mating disruption. And you can see how good it works. It actually, just by itself, will knock the population down, in this case, about 80%. And then you have the population down to 5.5%. There's graphics that show the same thing. These are just bar graphs showing those numbers. But this shows what the population that is unsuppressed is in red here, whereas the black dotted line would be the control population. This is mating disruption in blue, and then the red here is, again, the combination of those two sprays plus the uh, mating disruption. We also provide guidance on this, so we explain all the different things, the general comments, and then what the optimal way to do control programs is. So now let's look at an example. So this is a 55-acre orchard, which is leased to a management company that controls all timings and applications. They told me they had a terrible coddling moth year last year. They thought they would need to get, take it all out of organic to get control in 2019. They use mating disruption throughout the area, and this is not one of our users. So we are not responsible for this. So these are the five treatments that they are, uh, put on. So oil went on at about the right time. These two entrust sprays, they're 70% of what we recommend for them to do. And then there's two virus sprays for the leaf um, coddling moth that are at a third of the rate that is recommended by WSU. So this is when they applied things. So these are the first two sprays which went on together. This spray here is one of their strongest sprays, but it went on when there was no larvae out there to control. These uh, kind of were just sort of willy-nilly throughout the season. But even so, uh, if you look at it without mating disruption, they would have got uh, only a reduction down to 42%. But with mating disruption, um, just by itself, it knocked it down to 12.9% in this case. And then the best they did was, with all five treatments, was down to 6.1% of the untreated control. So that sounds pretty good, but let's see if we can do a little bit better. So what we did is we actually just did four oil sprays. So these are relatively non-toxic, won't really affect too many of the natural enemies. And so what we were able to do is cover 
put those on every 150 degree days and we essentially cover that first generation. And you can see that even without mating disruption, we were about 15%, 17% better. And we're half the rate of the population when we're using mating disruption. But this is the money slide again. So we have the grower plan. Their insecticide bill per acre was $258. The damage per acre is about 120. The total cost per acre, 377. And for the 55 acres, it's about um, $20,735. Now, with four oil sprays, you can see our spray bill was less than half, our damage was less than half, and the total cost per acre was about $200 less. We essentially still had to pay, but we saved $10,000, almost $11,000 compared to um, uh, the grower plan. And if we went to three oil sprays, we'd beat that just a little bit. It'd be about $11,220. And so we looked at this same grower for the last uh, four years. So this is slightly different in that these are the change in percent from the untreated population. So here, there's a difference so that they actually, in 2019, they knocked the population down more than we did. But they paid the price. So they actually paid $451 more per acre than we did. The damage cost was less in that case. And the total cost per acre was $385. Well, you can do the averages all the way through. We actually had lower damage than they did. We saved them $235 an acre, $9 here. And the total cost here um, of $244 per acre. And so they lost an average of $13,420 for that 55 acres for the last four years. So, and if you added the cost of an insecticide application, because it costs to run through the orchard there, it's actually higher. So their cost was $284 per acre higher than ours, which means they lost about $15,620 over the 55 acres. So I think that $75 an acre savings is a little bit off there. I think we're probably at least three or four times higher. Than that. So what's next? Well, these models can be run with historic data to show general times of susceptibility to pesticide applications of different residual periods. And so this is the oblique banded leaf roller model. We ran it for 65 locations by 13 years. We told it it had a 21-day residue, which is the equivalent of about three BT sprays. We applied the spray every 25 degree days. And what you see here is you get out here and there's almost no variability. It's because you didn't treat most of the population that occurred during that season. But there's a huge difference here in the spring where this is when it's 21 days of really nice weather. And then this is, uh, come on, ah. This is where it was cool, rainy, and variable there. So one of the things that we can do is we can say, oh, that curve actually is pretty predictable. How about if we integrate that into our decision support system? And so this shows a seven-day residue, 14-day residue, and a 21-day residue. And one of the things that this is useful for is looking at it and saying, OK, if we look right here at the best time for a spray to go on, we're down, a single spray is causing a reduction down to about 15% of the con untreated control. Whereas if we go on about 10 days later, we've lost almost 40% of the control that we would otherwise get, considering everything else is the same, simply because some of those insects have gone out of that stage or gone into stages where the pesticide is no longer effective. So we're actually, this is our development server. This is that same pesticide effects for Codling Boss so that people the idea is they can actually use the long-range forecast to look to the future and say, am I applying this at the right time? And if I'm not, then I should wait or I should do it at the right time because it can save you an awful lot of money. 
Okay, so let's talk about anticipating the future and climate change. So um, one of my best collaborators is uh, Kirti Rajagopalan. She's a biosystems engineering person who works with climate change as part of what she does. And she is the one behind Ag Climate Tools, which is done through um, the Ag College here. We also have Gloria DeGrandy Hoffman. She is the director of the Carl Hayden uh, Bee Lab in Tucson, Arizona. And her interest is using climate change to look and see how honeybees are affected by warmer falls and that sort of thing. Um, Lee Kalsitz, who was here earlier, he's been working with uh, Sunburn. Uh, Tobin Northfield, our new entomologist at the station, he is also interested in the honeybee population dynamics. And then I work with Kylie Moth, honeybee population dynamics, flowering, and a whole range of pest management concerns. And what I'm hoping is that we can take most of the models from DAS, give them to Kirti, and have her actually be able to run those with climate change projections so that people can actually look and say, how big a problem is this going to be for management of different uh, problems? So this is one of my favorite graphs here. So on the left, it's the parts per million of CO2. On the right is the deviation in temperature. And it's kind of scary when you look at it. And I actually have one that stops a little bit early. Because if you actually did it out to the next 100 years, it gets really crazy. So. Um, Talking about climate change scenarios, there's these things called representative concentration pathways. And so these are essentially standardized greenhouse uh, gas concentration trajectories that are projected over the next 100 years. There's a RCP 4.5, which is a very optimistic one that says our CO2 emissions will peak around 2040, then decline. But after 21, uh, 100, there'll be a 650 parts per million CO2. We're at about 400 now. When I was a graduate student, it was more like 340 or so parts per million. And the idea is that this scenario will give you a three and a quarter degree Fahrenheit mean increase in temperature. The current trajectory that we're on, unfortunately, is this uh, 8.5. It's the CO2 emissions rise throughout the 21st century. The CO2 parts per million will be 1,380 parts per million and still rising at that point in time. That is really scary with a 6.6 degrees Fahrenheit mean temperature increase. These standard RCP conditions are essentially used in a variety of climate models. And there's about 30 of those climate models right now all use the standard RCP scenarios, but they give you slightly different results. And so what you do is you take um, um, what's called a um, uh, ensemble forecast, where you bring together 10 or 20 of those, and you uh, reduce it down and say, OK, this is the median response to these different things. So this is for Kali Moth again. And so this is historic data. So if you can't read it, um, this is historic. This is generation three and the point where 75% or more of the eggs have uh, hatched. Um, and so historically, um, this is the percent of years where that happens. And you can see up north, we really are sort of less than 20% with most of them. And as we get here in Wenatchee and start heading down, it starts getting a little bit darker. And we're getting to the point where these things down here are showing 100% of them will go through uh, three generations and 75% of them have. So let's, what we can do up here is we can click on these different uh, values for different time zones. So we'll click on the one for 2040 and the um, current trajectory we're on. And you can see everywhere is going to get 100% of the time that three generations of eggs. So that's not very useful. So let's go back and uh, click on that again and go to the historic. And then what we did is we changed this so that we're looking at the fourth generation with 75% egg hatch. And so again, this is great. No place has got that historically. Go to 2020 or 2040. And all of a sudden, it looks like what I showed you a generation ago. 
So essentially, in 2040, we will have everybody that had three generations and three quarters uh, hatched is going to have four generations and hatch. And then we go down to 2060, the next one. And you can see everywhere down here is uh, doing that. And as we go out to 2080, all of them show up there as well. So again, a really severe problem that's happening. And all of this is just before diapause induction. So it's not even considering some of those that would make it a little bit further um, out. So these climate change scenarios can also be used with our pesticide effects models. Um, and the reason you want to do this uh, is you want to see, well, what is going to happen to us in terms of management? So codling moth, you can easily write a prescription on how to control codling moth. And so if you put an oil treatment on it 375 degree days, then the first conventional treatment is applied at 525. And then the second conventional treatment happens 14 days later. This is based on the residual activity of material. We can run this, and what we did is use 10 climate change scenarios, and then we have 30 years. So 2040 is actually 2025 to 2055, and so on down here. And so what we're going to do is show you uh, the median uh, response across all those different scenarios and time periods. So there's about 310 or so uh, of those years. So this is what we see. So mating disruption, which I mentioned before, um, is the black bars. And you can see it actually gets better with time. And the reason for that is mating disruption works by essentially um, the delay of mating occurs on a degree day scale. And so since it's hotter days, the delay is longer, which means the reproduction is slower for the moths. So that's a good thing. But then when you look at the blue bars here, you can see that there is no variability there to speak of. That's because our sprays cover most of that first generation as it is. And so you're not really going to get much benefit uh, there. But the combination of the two continues to work really well and, and get you out here. But there's some caveats to this. One is that having more generations means that you have more population and pest pressure out there. The overwintering populations will also be higher because you went through another generation. And the generation increase from generation to generation is somewhere around 6 to 10 um, fold each generation. The warmer fall also means that some of the insects that escape diapause induction in late August will make it to the overwintering stage. So that means more individuals make it to the overwintering stage as well. Uh, as I mentioned, mating disruption works better when it's warmer. Um, pest side effects are relatively constant. But that's with optimal timing. As I showed you before, there's a lot of non-optimal timing that happens. And when you're not doing optimal timing, the treatment windows become narrower. And missing those right timings makes uh, more individuals escape control and your damages. So what else are we evaluating? Well, the climate change scenarios can be looked at, as I mentioned, on a wide range of things. And so essentially, what we want to do is use DAS to provide another tool to help growers and managers plan for the future. So we're working on uh, chilling units. So that's one of the things that we're working with uh, the calcits on. Uh, the codling moth, I've already shown you some of that stuff. Honeybee population dynamics. Again, one of the big differences in these climate change scenarios is that in the fall, the honeybees don't go into a sort of a overwintering state where they're fairly quiescent because the temperatures are fairly nice. And then they go out and uh, forage at that point in time. And then later on, um, they shut down as the temperature does get colder. But then in the spring, they're aged more because they were out foraging during the fall. Uh, flowering times, we've looked at flowering times, and that's also on uh, Kiersey's website. But basically, we can expect anywhere from five to six weeks earlier when you go all the way um, to 20, uh, 2100. We're starting to work on some of the other uh, insects. 
Uh, Lee is also working on the sunburn browning. Storage salt is one of those things where in the fall you want cold temperatures before it goes into storage, otherwise it uh, gives a disorder. Um, fruit growth, we've also looked at that so we can actually predict when the fruit will be full sized. And again, some of those early forecasts are really early. It's kind of scary. I mean, like a month or more early. Um, other things we need to work on, diseases, especially fire blight. Um, Kirthi is doing some work on one of our grants for site selection, particularly for um, uh, grapes, where they want to have grapes in the ground for 50 or 60 years. So we're also looking at it in terms of um, uh, tree fruit, where uh, you don't have quite that same length of time in the ground. So just in summary, the decision support tools can dramatically help managers and create a new communication channel to our clientele. They can be used to evaluate past failures and successes. They can help deal with the present, and they can anticipate the future. But we need to really be able to communicate clearly about what the problems and solutions are, not only in pest management, but climate change as well. So agriculture, a lot of people say they're really conservative. And that's true in some respects, but not in others. We have a lot of early adopters which drive dissemination of our data. And these growers and managers are realizing change is coming because they're living it at this point. So in the last five or six years, we've actually had um, a shift in when bloom occurred of almost four weeks. You know, it's not all in one direction. It goes back and forth one way or another. But it's a lot more variable in the spring. And that really throws people off. Go, what do I do? You know, how does this affect everything else? So they're realizing that they're living it. And really, climate change is the, the challenge of our lifetime, or at least I believe so. It's getting that information to our clientele in a way that they can actually relate to it will be critical for our future. So we need to do it in a way that is not political, but instead is, look, this is what's happening. How do you deal with this? What can you do to make sure that they're not going to get driven out of business by this sort of thing? They will make those other decisions, hopefully, as they go on and realize, if I hadn't done this, we're going to get hammered. So um, basically, um, that's the presentation, the acknowledgment, the different funding sources, um, my lab members. Callie and Tani have worked with me for about 19 years awesome to have them there. They do all the hard work, and I don't. Um, Stefano Borgi is our programmer. Uta Chambers was a longtime manager educator we had uh, for DAS. Um, he left Matt Jones. Dr. Matt Jones has taken it. Peter Scheer worked there. And then a, a range of collaborators which have helped make this. And then this is the slide for Laura. So basically, why you should work with insects, or have your children work for insects, or have students work with insects. They're a great group to work with. And if you want to know any more about it, you could ask me, but you better ask Laura. So with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. <laughs> Okay, so the question, uh, and I'm repeating it because it's being videotaped. Um, the question is, are we more likely to have uh, resistance development in the future with the climate change scenarios that we're seeing with more generations and higher numbers? Um, not if they're used correctly. So the mating disruption really hits sort of at a, um, 
very specific target. And it's pretty hard for them to change that blend very much. There is possibilities they could change the blend, and it could be that um, if once the uh, females change the pheromone that they're putting out, and if males can detect it, then essentially that would be a very quick evolution of resistance in that action. But it's pretty hard to do it because it's a very conserved trait in, in the organism. The insecticides, if they're used correctly, no, it shouldn't be an issue. So that is, as long as you're not using some things which are detoxified in the exact same way, then essentially you're not selecting continuously for them. However, if they're not aware of when those generations occur and they're just thinking that generations take a month or six weeks or something like that, then yeah, they could actually cause some very severe problems. And I think one of the biggest problems is that a lot of times people think in terms of an insecticide that, oh, this controls insect A. But it also affects any other insect that it hits at the same time. And so the issue becomes they're treating only the first generation for collie moth, but that was three generations of spider mites or four generations of spider mites or something like that. And so one of the things that we're trying to do with our system is provide a more holistic view, and it's actually quite difficult to do, where all these different models that we have need to interact so that you're saying, look, you put on this for this material or for this pest, but it also affected these five other pests, and you shouldn't have applied them in the same pest. So it's a challenge, um, and it could potentially result in more resistance and more pest. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, Washington State and British Columbia. Yeah. Well, the difficulty in expanding it, it infrastructure-wise, we could easily expand it. It's not really an issue. The problem is the legality, so that when each state can have slightly different rules on which pesticides are approved for use in that state, and then you've also got to look at what their management is and collaborate with that group. And even the Canadians, who are really great collaborators, there's been a few times I've pulled my hair out, you know, and I don't have that much to lose, <laughs> which makes it even worse, you know. But um, there's, there's certain issues. And for example, for us, this idea of using multiple oils in that first generation is a great tactic. But Canada doesn't allow oils to be used they're not registered for collie moth, so they, they could be applied for something else during that period, but they can't be applied for collie moth. So when we write the recommendations for them, we've got to get around that in some way. So we can say, if you put it on for mites, or you put it on for aphids, which are the targets that they allow, then you don't have to do this. But it, it, it kind of gets convoluted. And the big difference, though, is when you go outside the arid west, so we're basically a desert with irrigation. But if you go to New York, it's radically different. They have a lot more sprays for, uh, they have more insect problems than we do, and they have more disease problems. And one of the things um, my very first graduate student um, actually did is she worked on apple maggot, and they emerge in this beautiful, nice curve, you know, sort of thing. And it's like, yeah, this is great. And then we realized that the water on right before they start emerging, they all emerge at once. So, you know, it won't even work on the other side of the mountain. So it has to be more in terms of, uh, and you have to know all those different factors as well. So you do have to work with a lot of different groups. But we could easily deal with California, Oregon. Some people in Oregon actually use our system because they have some weather stations now. Um, British Columbia, Utah, and probably even Colorado are pretty much all, it wouldn't be a problem to, to expand it as well. Anything else? Um,
Okay, so the question is, was there any problems special to um, Canada and the international difference between us and not being in the U.S.? The biggest thing was making sure that they had some of the things that we did. So, for example, we actually, WSU has a spray guide that tells people what to spray, when to spray it, and, and what the rates are and all that sort of stuff. And so as part of our system, what we had done is finally convinced uh, in about 2009, I guess, or so, um, the publications people to make that into a database. And so we don't maintain that either. We query that database. And so that was one of the questions. But they already had one, but there was some differences, and so we had to work with um, some of those differences to ask them to add features so that it would, and then they didn't have, for example, our pesticide effects on natural enemies, and so we merged that in and that sort of stuff. I, I'd say the biggest problem is just um, their weather stations. So um, I had to write all new routines which looked at the quality of their weather stations and make sure that everything was working. We used to use NOAA data, but NOAA doesn't go past the border. So that's when we switched to dark sky, and it actually is a better thing for us because it's much simpler to access that data. We just give them a latitude-longitude pair and the dates that we're interested in, it, and it comes back to us, and then we can put it into our system. But um, I think it was that. And then the other big problem there was they didn't have the long-term uh, education program that we have had here. So their industry is much smaller than ours. And so they weren't as familiar with some of the degree day models and things that uh, our growers were. Um, they also have this sterile insect release program, which we don't have. And it's kind of a, a difficult sometimes to see how those things mesh in, and there's a lot of factors that makes that a lot less predictable than, for example, the use of mating disruption, which is functionally equivalent to what we have. So I think anywhere you go, you will have some issues, and it's just a matter of trying to sort through them and see how large those issues are. But almost always, it's the quality of their weather network. How many stations do you have? Where are they? You know, and like in our system, one of the nice things is that you can actually see um, in a Google Maps sort of thing, okay, this is where the stations are, and you can drag a little pointer that says, okay, this is where you are, and then you can touch each of the stations around you, and it'll tell you it's, you know, a mile away, and it's a thousand feet higher or lower, and so you can sort of get an idea of which stations would be better for you. But in the long run, what we're hoping to do is use these gridded high-density weather forecasts so that they're generally at a kilometer resolution now. And so you would just essentially say, OK, this is where I'm at, instead of using an environmental weather monitoring system. Anything else? Laura. That are useful. Um, there's a lot of places that store a bunch of models, but they're generally just a number. So it'll say something. And a lot of them, like California, for example, um, they'll calculate degree days, but they won't tell you what that means. So you don't know is, what do we do at this time, you know? And you know, I've worked with these models now actually for most of my career. And except when I was in Hawaii. But um, what it comes down to is even I get confused on some of these things, and I have to look it up sometimes, particularly if it's not one that I've been working with in the last, let's say, two weeks or three weeks or four weeks, something like that. So what ours actually does is it says, look, you've got moths flying. You know, the population should be going up or it should be going down. Um, this is what it means in terms of management. So there's only one other place that has anything close to ours, and that's Switzerland. Theirs is a, about the same age as ours is, but we have more models than they do, and ours is a lot more explicit than theirs is. 
There's a zone tree fruit. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's it's really kind of a a cool thing because as you get more models together, all of a sudden you can start looking at it and understanding the system in a much finer detail, as well as make the models better. Because once you can predict, for example, when bloom occurs, there's certain insects that only are important during the bloom period. Once the fruit get over a certain size, then they're no longer causing damage to it. And so you can start pulling those different things together and start to understand how things are working and predict ahead further, this is what's going to happen. And then essentially you can also start doing that stuff with the climate change scenarios so that you're able to say, okay, well, what's really going to happen down the road and how much variability are we like to see even from year to year? Yes, sir. Oh, no. Me too. <laughs> so the question is, you know, what do you do in terms of the long term about this, this sort of system? Not everybody does this sort of research, and that's a real problem. Um, this idea of being quantitative and developing the models and then improving the models, validating the models, that's a critical part of this. So, for example, um, most of our models have between 17 or 18 orchard years worth of data built as validation so that you're actually looking at it and going, how well did it perform over time? And, you know, none of our models is perfect like any other model, but we're generally around 85% of the time correct. And that's a pretty good thing compared to flipping a coin or thinking that you're, oh, you know, what am I supposed to do at this point? Well, I'm just going to do this. Well, Having some sort of framework on decision making really makes a big difference for people. They can really um, live with a framework if you give them a clear framework. In terms of what will happen when I retire, um, being the oldest person in this room, I probably quite a bit, other than, well, a couple of years. Uh, <laughs> um, that's a concern, but. Um, what we're hoping to do, um, we've already got somebody lined up who wants to do this sort of thing as, as the director and essentially take that mantle over. And so there'll be a transition period between he and I and work on, you know, I still have probably an additional, enough data for probably another five to eight models, just in insects, much less working with the Tree Fruit Research Commission to do some of the ones on bloom timings and, and other things as well. So I'll probably continue at a reduced rate um, for a couple of years at least until, you know, the golf courses get really nice. And then it might change. But you do have to plan for that sort of thing. It's, and it's, it's always kind of scary when you're thinking of yourself. Gee, how old am I? Oh, well. You know, 10 years is a long time for somebody my age at this point. So, you know, you have to think about it. That's why I've asked Louis to work for me. He's young. <laughs> Any more? Thank you.